So I was in the army, as many of you know, and I was training to become an army chaplain. And I was deathly afraid of going to boot camp. And I wasn't deathly afraid because I was afraid that I couldn't do the physical activities or that I wasn't gonna fit in. I was deathly afraid of being yelled at by a drill sergeant. I'm a words of affirmation person. I can handle criticism, but not when somebody is yelling at me. So I was thinking about how in the world I was going to devise a plan to avoid getting yelled at for the weeks that I was going to be at boot camp. And I, this was my plan. I wanted the drill sergeants to not remember my name. I wanted them to not know who I was. I didn't want to be the best, and I didn't want to be the worst. I wanted to be so middle of the road that they would have no idea that I was even there. In fact, if I could have found camouflage to wear that would have hidden me from the other people in camouflage, I would have done it. That's how insecure and scared I was. In fact, when I was in my uniform, I was so insecure. I was an officer. And I was outranking uh, several people. When you're an officer, you, you're supposed to salute uh, after you've been saluted too when someone's an enlisted soldier. And I saw somebody and I could have sworn he was a colonel and I saluted him first and it turns out he was just a low ranking uh, specialist, which nothing wrong with specialists, but for me, I thought for sure that I was gonna get in trouble if I didn't salute this person. And they just laughed at me. I was so insecure when I was first in the army. And insecurity is a funny thing. It, it has a way of showing up when we're experiencing something that's new. When we're in a new situation, a new environment, like being in the army, when we're in, we're in the new normal that we've talked about over this Daniel series, insecurity seems to crop up. The things that we thought we held on to for our identity, the things that we hold on to for security, those things sort of fade away and our insecurity pops up. Maybe you see it because you're insecure about the way that you look. Maybe you're insecure about the way that you talk. Maybe you're insecure about the amount of money you have, your life status, your family. There's a lot of things that we can be insecure about. And because we tend to be rather prideful, our insecurity stems from a place of pride. We're afraid to be found out. We're afraid that we're going to be humiliated. We're afraid we're gonna be yelled at by someone, maybe ourselves. What I want us to do today is I want us to talk about Daniel 5, and I want us to talk about pride, similar to what we talked about last week in Daniel 4, but I want us to look at it from the perspective of insecurity, because insecurity is a unique offshoot of pride, and it's something that we experience, like I said, as we look at the new normal. So we're gonna be in Daniel 5 today, and I want us to look at three things that we need to remember as we compare an insecure king with a secure servant of God. So what's the first thing we need to remember? We need to remember our place. We need to remember our place. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. And then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, it is unlikely this new king that we're meeting, the last king we met was Nebuchadnezzar. This is probably not actually his son. It's probably his grandson or his great-grandson. We know from history that there are several kings in between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. We also know that Belshazzar probably wasn't fully king yet. His father was named Nabonidus. And Nabonidus didn't exactly abdicate the throne, but he also wasn't in Babylon ruling. He kind of turned the ruling of the kingdom over to Belshazzar. But none of the uh, ceremonies, none of the endorsements that are supposed to come with a new king came to Belshazzar. And you know what that breeds? That breeds insecurity. And we're gonna find out by the end of the chapter, spoiler alert, Belshazzar is going to die as an insecure king. His kingdom is going to fall apart around him. In fact, we know that the Persian Empire was invading Babylon at this time, and they're right outside the city gates. And so what does Belshazzar do? Does he put on armor? Does he rally the nobles? Does he rally the other leaders of his kingdom and say, we're going to charge. If we're going to go down, we're going to go down fighting. No, 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 that's not what he does because he's insecure. What he does instead is that he elects to throw a big banquet. 
And the reason why he throws a big banquet and he invites the vessels, the, the items, the utensils of the temple of God to be used is to show that he's big and bad. He's bigger than Yahweh. He's bigger than these defeated gods. Nebuchadnezzar may have taken these goods, but I'm actually gonna use them because that's how unafraid I am. Even Nebuchadnezzar, who burned the temple to the ground, wasn't willing to do this. He had more respect than that. He's incredibly proud and he's incredibly insecure and immediately he's found out for what he is. Look at verse five. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand and the king saw the hand as it wrote and then the king's color changed. So what happened was he was rosy red with alcohol. Now I'm a good Baptist. I don't know what people look like when they drink, but I imagine that he went from being rosy red to very, very pale. His color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. He became possessed with what is this thing? It's so terrifying to see. His limbs gave way. This limbs gave way, the way the Hebrew technically reads, it probably, or excuse me, the Aramaic, the way it reads, it sounds a lot like his bowels were loosened. It's almost like he soiled himself in this instance. And then it says his knees knocked together. His knees knocked together. If you're a leader and you're in a military conflict, not being able to stand because your knees are weak is not a winning quality. Have you ever had this happen to you where everything seems to be going great or you're at least making it look like everything seems to be going great and then it all comes crashing down. One small thing, one event, one thing that catches you by surprise throws you completely off of your game and your insecurities are exposed. Maybe it's a major thing. Maybe it's, it's a, a, a trouble in your marriage. Maybe it's trouble with your kids. Maybe it's a layoff in your job. Or maybe it's something small. Maybe you weren't included on a project or maybe uh, you just have a fight with your spouse in the morning or maybe it's, it's a moving situation. Whatever it is, you were doing really well at hiding all the vulnerabilities, all the flaws, all the insecurities that you have. And then this one thing happens and they're put on display for everyone to see. And what happens in this situation is we wind up overcorrecting. We wind up losing our place because we thought that we were good where we, at, we were at and then we get exposed as being vulnerable, as being insecure in that place. We think that if we can climb the ladder high enough, if we can become more secure, if we can become stronger, if we can get that promotion, if we can just go to that marriage conference, if we can just get our kids into that school or if we can just get our kids to see that person, everything's gonna be okay. We're gonna rise above the insecurities we have and we're gonna be invulnerable to them. And so we get ambitious. Ambition is a sign of insecurity because ambition is trying to climb above the rising waters of our fears and the threats that come after us. And this is what Belshazzar does. In order to not look weak in front of his leaders, he throws a big feast to show that he's bigger and badder than his predecessor, the greatest king Babylon ever had. He's gonna prove, he's gonna try and prove through a banquet that he was just as good, if not better, than Nebuchadnezzar. He forgets to honor God. He overreaches. He overextends himself. He puts him in a place that he shouldn't be. Maybe you have someone in your life that you know that's like this, or maybe this is you yourself. Maybe you've seen it in a friend where a friend so desperately wants something or they want to be liked so much that they try too hard. Or maybe you have a boss that's either newly promoted or very insecure in their uh, managerial position, and so they micromanage or they're, they're just really, really rude to those around them. They wind up being out of place. When we become ambitious, we get out of place and we forget where we're supposed to be. Now, there's one other thing that's out of place in this story. The book that we're actually reading is called Daniel, and yet we haven't seen Daniel. Where is he? Well, let's look in verse uh, uh, 8. Excuse me, verse 10. The queen, because of the words of the kings and the lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods in the days of your fathers, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. So what the king has done is he's called all of his counselors, all of his advisors, all of his wise men together and he wants them to interpret this writing on the wall and none of them can do it and he promises them great riches in order to do it. 
And the queen, who's probably not his wife, it's probably his mom or his grandmother, comes in and says, look, Daniel's the guy in charge of this. Daniel's the guy in charge of all these people you call him. Why didn't you call him in? He's the man at this stuff. Nebuchadnezzar, your predecessor, was really, really smart and put him in charge. Why aren't you using him? Daniel isn't there. Now, if it's you or me and we're not invited to something that we feel like we should have been invited in, we immediately become riddled with insecurity. If there's a wedding and I feel like I'm close enough to the bride or groom to be in the wedding party, but I'm not included, we get really, really upset about those things. Or if there's a party and we're not invited, again, we get really upset, unless you're an introvert and then maybe you don't. If you have a job, and, and you're a manager or you're in charge of a project or you're a department head and there's a meeting that you feel like you should be included in and for some reason you're not included, you begin to immediately worry about your job, about your career. What's my future at this company? Do people respect me? Why wasn't I invited to this? Being excluded has a way of showing our insecurities and we wind up focusing on them quite a bit. Is this what Daniel does? Apparently not. Daniel does not overextend himself. He's not ambitious. He knows he's in charge of the astrologers and the, the, the wise men and the counselors, but he doesn't force himself into the, into the boardroom of the king. He doesn't throw the doors open and say, why wasn't I included? Well, where is Daniel? Well, I, I don't know. It doesn't say what Daniel was doing, but I have a guess based on the rest of the book of Daniel. Again, remember the kingdom is burning. There is an army right outside the gates of Babylon. Here's my guess at what Daniel is doing and has been doing for a while. He's in his room. He's praying, he's fasting, he's seeking the Lord. He's praying that God would be gracious to the Babylonians, even though they hauled away his people in exile. He's praying for his people that they will be treated well in the midst of being ruled by another group of people. Daniel is secure and he's so secure, he's so secure in his identity in Christ that he's able to not worry about the slights and the abuses that he's facing and he's able to worry about other people. He's able to be concerned for them. When you're secure in your place in Christ, when you know you have a relationship with him, when you've put your faith in him and you find all of your identity in him, you don't worry so much about your own needs, you begin to worry about the needs of others. And you don't have to be, I have a Messiah complex about it. In the age of social media, we like to help and we like to be seen helping, but that's not how the actual Messiah went about his life. Yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he died for our sins. And yes, he's the savior of the world. And yes, he's coming again. But after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to like 500 people and then he left. Now he's returning again, but it's not like Jesus went to Rome, kicked the tour down of the, of the praetorium and was like, all right, emperor, I'm in charge now because I'm the risen Lord. It's not what Jesus does. We so desperately want to help, but we also want to be seen helping because we're insecure. Jesus is not like that. He's not like Belshazzar. He's not even like Nebuchadnezzar. He's a humble king who sacrifices to lift up other people. And he wants to lift you up. He wants to raise you out of the insecurity you feel, whether it's about the way you look, the way you, you talk, the way you act with other people, whether you're insecure about your job, your finances, your place in life, your race, your religion, whatever it is, Jesus Christ wants to lift you out of that insecurity and he wants to rescue you. Now, we only can have this if we find our place. We know our place in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make something very clear. Sometimes people use the expression, know your place, as a phrase of oppression. They use this so that people who have less power than them don't rise up against them. That's not the way I'm using this here. In fact, I would say if you know your place in Christ, we are better equipped to throw off oppressors. Jesus himself says that don't fear the person who can only kill the body, but fear the one who can kill the body and soul. Your soul, your life is secure with Jesus Christ. And so we are better able to throw off oppression. We're better able to throw off racism and injustice in our society if we know our place in Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter what they do to us now. We're secure in Christ and we're better able to watch out for the injustices that are done to other people, not just to ourselves. So it is so critical that you know your place in Christ in order for us to move forward as a people and as the body of Christ. So we need to know our place and our places with Jesus Christ. But we also need to know about our past. 
We need to know about our past. I love this part of the story because Daniel and Belshazzar have a wonderful interaction. Have you ever watched an, inter an interaction between two people and neither one of them is super impressed with the other person? It's very awkward and strange and that's exactly what we get here in this part of Daniel 5, an awkward interaction. Let's look at what Belshazzar says in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel. If anybody ever puts that in front of your name when they're talking to you, it's meant as a put down. You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. And then he goes on to, to kind of illustrate the reward. He reiterates the reward that he's gonna offer to Daniel. He's gonna make him third in the kingdom. He's gonna put a robe on him and all this great stuff. Let's look at what Belshazzar says to Daniel in order to make sure that Daniel knows where he ranks in the scheme of things. One, he says, you're that Daniel. Again, that's a, that's a put down. He's like, I don't even know you. This is probably the first time they've talked. He says that you've come from Judah, which is a backwater. You're not a Babylonian. You're not, you're not great like the Babylonian. You're, you're from Judah, who cares? Then he says, my father hauled away your fathers. Translation, this is schoolyard talk. My dad beat up your dad is basically what this means, which is very mature, Belshazzar. Well done, well done. And then he says this, he says, I have heard it said of you that you can do these things. There's skepticism there. He's saying, prove it. I've heard you can do this, but I want you to prove it now. And all of this is disparaging and derogatory because what the king is doing, he's bringing up Daniel's past, but he's skipping over all of his accomplishments. It's a selective reading of history. He's skipping over all of his accomplishments. It's like calling Dwight Eisenhower that guy from Kansas or calling Troy Aikman that guy from Oklahoma. Yeah, nothing wrong with Oklahoma and Kansas, but they've done a few things since they left the state. The king is focused only on where Daniel grew up and what his past was, not what he's done recently. And if Daniel is insecure in the Lord, this would probably work. This would probably throw him off his game because people do this all the time. They bring up our past to us to put us under control. How many of you get ridiculed for mistakes you made in the past? How many of you have friends that kind of joke about things you've screwed up in the past? How many of you experienced bullying? If you're in high school or in middle school or elementary school, you experienced bullying and people make fun of you because of a mistake you made. How many of us have something in our past that we wish wasn't there and we try to cover it up? Maybe Satan brings up to you all the time mistakes and failings and sin that you've had in your life and that you think there's no way God can use you because of this thing. There's no way God can love you because of this thing. If we're insecure, if we're not secure in Christ, we will think to ourselves that that's true. This is the, one of the greatest mistakes we make when it comes to our past. We give it too much weight. We give it way too much weight. We think there's no way God can love me. There's no way God can use me because of the mistakes I've made in my past. There's no way God can forgive me. He can forgive other people, but he can't forgive me. Let me tell you this, that's actually a special kind of pride. To think that God can't forgive you because your sins are so great but God can forgive other people because theirs aren't as bad as you, that makes you special. That makes you a unique situation. That's a special kind of, kind of self-detrimental pride that's really messed up. But you need to know that God can forgive us no matter how great our sins are, no matter how much we've messed up. And Daniel, he's secure in the Lord. In fact, look what he says in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel says, I can't be bought. I can't be bought. I can't be paid off. I'm gonna give you the right interpretation of what's happening, and it's not going to affect me. You can keep your rewards to yourself. Plus, Daniel probably has a better idea of what's going on in the kingdom than Belshazzar does, because who wants to be third in a kingdom that's crumbling around you? It's a worthless gift. It's a worthless reward. And so Daniel begins to do the interpretation, but he starts by reminding the king of his past. He goes back. He's like, oh, you want to bring up my past? Let's bring up yours. Look at verse 18. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. Belshazzar is probably like, yes, yes, of course, this is very true. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, 
He was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. We talked about this last week. Nebuchadnezzar had a fit of madness for a while, where he was driven out into the wilderness because he was too proud, he hadn't humbled himself. Now I'm sure that at banquets and parties they would bring out the old record books and they would talk about the great deeds of past Babylonian kings. And I'm sure that at no point did anybody ever say, hey, you know what, let's hear the story about our greatest king and how he went crazy for a while and ate grass like a donkey. That's fun, let's talk about that. No, I'm sure that got swept under the rug. They ignored that. And that's another thing that we can do to our past. Rather than give it too much weight, we give it too little weight. We try to hide it, we sweep it under the rug. We think to ourselves, you know what, I'm not as bad as other people. In fact, I'm probably better than most people. I'm not gonna let myself be vulnerable. I'm not gonna let my insecurities come out. In fact, I'm gonna act like I've never done anything wrong ever, and I'm gonna expect people to treat me that way. We sweep our past under the rug. We can either give it too much weight or too little weight. And this is a mistake that we make often. And this is where I think one of Belshazzar's failings is so, so great, because he forgets. Look what Daniel says, verse 22, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, and then this is so key, though you knew it, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver, gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. Belshazzar knew the story of Nebuchadnezzar, but he thought he was greater than Nebuchadnezzar. He thought, yeah, my, my, my grandfather or great-grandfather messed up, but I'm better than that. I'm bigger than that. I'm stronger than that. I'm not going to make those mistakes again. I'm wiser than he is. I'm smarter than he is. And Daniel's saying, not only are you not wiser than he is, you're not even as wise as he is because you didn't even listen to the letter that he wrote you so that this wouldn't happen to you. Rather than taking the knowledge that he's gained from his predecessor, and ruling wisely and effectively and turning to the Lord and asking the Lord to deliver his kingdom out of the hands of the Persians, what does he do? He throws a party and he acts like he's bigger and badder than everybody else is to cover over his insecurities. He's running from his past. So many of us respond to our past in different ways. Some of us think because of our past, because of where we were born or the family we were born into or the amount of money that we have, that we've inherited, that our past doesn't matter. We, we, we have a special entitled privilege in life. And we find our security there. We find our hope there in the inheritance that we have. Others of us, like I said, try to sweep it under the rug. We try to ignore it. We try to act like our past doesn't affect us. And so even though we've made several mistakes along the way, we blame everybody else. It's not my fault, I didn't do that. That's, if, it, if I had just gotten a couple of other breaks, things would have gone differently, maybe so. But at some point you have to own the fact that your decisions are your decisions today. And it's your responsibility to turn to the Lord and find your security there. My hope for you is that your past will be rightly judged. It will be a past that will rest with Jesus Christ. Are you going to let insecurity about your past, whether it's something you're ashamed of, whether it's something you're proud of, whether you think it gives you all the importance in the world, or whether you think it gives you none? At some point, you need to hand your past over to Jesus Christ. Are you gonna let the insecurity about your past and the insecurity that your past provides, are you gonna let it damage your present and your future in the Lord? So here's what I wanna do. I just wanna take a minute, and I want you to pray right where you're at, and I want to offer something to the Lord from your past, whether it's something you're ashamed of, something that you're proud about, whatever, and give it to him and say, Lord, I'm gonna trust you with this. So let's pray just one brief moment. Father, take our past, redeem them, rescue them. Use them to bring glory to yourself and to bring sanctification in our lives. Bring us to you in your son's name. Amen.
We need to leave our past behind. It creates insecurity, but we also need to think about a future, right? And our future is one that we will all have coming to us. We need to remember that we will all perish. We are all going to die. Look at verse 24. Then from his presence, and the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is what the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Daniel solves the riddle on the wall, the writing on the wall. The w- words on the wall weren't a foreign language. It was probably more like a word puzzle. The words sounded like some Aramaic terms for measurements, for weights and measures. And so Daniel figures this out, obviously through divine inspiration and help. The word mene, mene sounds like mina, which is the Aramaic word for weighed, or sorry, for numbered. Sh- uh, tekel sounds like shekel which is the one for for Wade. And Perez sounds like Parson, which is essentially half shekel or divided. What Daniel tells him, as you read, is, look, you've been numbered. Your days are numbered. You have been weighed. The worth, the contribution you've made to this kingdom has been weighed and found wanting, and you are going to die tonight, and your whole empire is going to be divided up. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining what this means, because the truth of this passage should hit all of us like a truck. We are all going to die. Every single one of us. And what you've built your life around, what you've found security in, what you've found hope in, whether it's money, whether it's clothes, whether it's achievements, education, whatever, that is all going to get counted at the end of your life. At your funeral, people will read off your accomplishments. It'll be on the nice obituary in the newspaper or on the back of a a bulletin or something like that. That will be counted up. It will be weighed. And people will say, oh, they were a good person or they were a bad person. And then your literal physical inheritance will be divided up among your descendants. And that's the fate that awaits all of us. Many of us have tried in our insecurity to stave off our mortality. We think if we could be healthy enough, then we'll live forever. I'm going to eat right, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to diet, and all those things are good things, but they're not going to keep you alive forever. We think to ourselves, if I can just achieve enough, if I can rise above it, I can get my name on a building, or I can get my name on a foundation, or on a scholarship, or something that can become important like that, then at least my name will live forever, and I can pass that name on to my kids and my grandkids. It'll be something for them to be proud of. We think that if we can achieve immortality, we can chase away insecurity. And that's just not true, because here's the thing. Your days are numbered. Everything you've done is going to be weighed, and then that is going to get passed down to your children. Whatever you found your security, however you ran away from insecurity, your kids or those around you, the next generation, if we're gonna look at it from a collective sense, they are going to learn to handle insecurity the way that we've learned to handle insecurity. So whatever we're passing down to them, if we found it in wealth or we found it in addictions or escape or whatever it is that we found, we're giving our descendants a poisoned inheritance. It may seem nice to give your kids a bunch of money, but if that's where they find their hope and security, you are ruining them and their grandkids and their great-grandkids. It's a poisoned inheritance. But what if you could give something that could not be weighed, it could not be numbered, and when it was divided out amongst people, it didn't become weaker, but it became stronger? What if you passed down a relationship with Christ? What if you pass down the, the practice of finding your security in Jesus Christ? What if you taught them how to do that? That'd be a great gift. So how do you do that? Well, it means you have to be vulnerable with your insecurities. It means you have to show them that when you're insecure, when you're scared, when you're worried, when life hits you on the chin, you don't hide it, you don't lock down, you don't run away from it, but instead you show your kids and the next generation around you. Maybe you don't have any kids, but there are certainly younger people around you. Maybe you can show them how you find your hope and security in Christ. So when you're scared, when you have a bad day, You show them, I turn to the scriptures, I turn to the word of God, I put my faith in Jesus Christ every day when I'm scared. 
When you're wrong, you don't try to cover it up. You don't try to, try to shift blame onto other people. Instead, what you do is you own it and apologize. Because when I apologize, I'm vulnerable. And yeah, that might make me a little insecure because guess what? I might be wrong about something. But insecure people try to cover up their mistakes rather than owning up to them. You can show other people that your heart so squarely rests in Christ and your hope for a future so squarely rests in him that you're generous with what you have, your time, your energy, your money. And you show that security doesn't come from those things. Security comes from Jesus Christ. I don't know what your relationship with Jesus is. Maybe you don't have one and you've tried to find security in a bunch of other little things. Let those things go. Jesus Christ died so that you might be secure with him forever. He was raised so that you might be raised and have an eternity with him. It's the only way to achieve immortality. Turn to him. Put your faith in him. Don't put your faith in these other things for security. Say, Lord Jesus, I want to give you my future. I want to find my security in you because you died for me. And if you've been a believer, it's really the same principle. Every single day you wake up, there's a mountain of things to be scared about. There's a pandemic. It's rising. It's scary. We're insecure. Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? Do I go out? Do I not go out? Do I go eat? Do I not go eat? What do I do? It's par- petrifying and paralyzing. But if I find my security in Christ, I can trust him in that. That's a place to start when making these decisions. Because one day we're all going to perish. And that should keep us all very humble. Because one day we're going to have to give up everything we're finding our security in except for one thing. And that's the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing you can take with you. I hope that you won't be like me when I was in the army, trying to just avoid being yelled at, trying to avoid being called out, trying to avoid having my insecurity be put on there. I probably could have learned a lot more about the army, probably could have been a better soldier if I had shown my insecurity so that people would have taught me to do wiser things. Look, we need to know our place, we need to know our past, and we need to know that we will perish. Instead of trying to find the cure for our insecurities in things like ambition, in things like immortality, in things like uh, running away from our past, sweeping things under the rug, you need to find your security in Jesus Christ. And you do that by making yourself vulnerable to him and to other people. To not do that is pride, but it is truly humbling to come before the Lord and say, I'm scared, I'm worried, I'm concerned, and to share that with other people. And you know what happens? you wind up being secure. I hope that you will find your security in Christ. And I hope that you don't waste any time doing it.